Hi, I'm Mary Alice, and I love vegetable gardening. Today, we're going to talk about planning your vegetable garden, which is a really exciting process. I'd like to begin by telling you a little bit about myself, by asking you a little bit about yourself, and then we're going to jump right into this. First of all, I'm an extension master gardener. I've been a master gardener for about nine years. My background is that I was born and raised in Western North Carolina. Hmm, wait a minute. Can, can you tell that by the way I talk? But anyway, uh, I was born and raised in Western North Carolina. I am a teacher, an artist, a writer. I'm a mom, a grandma. I'm a performance poet. But very passionately, I'm a gardener. My family, as I was growing up, we had a vegetable garden always. Now, that vegetable garden was not for a, a hobby. It was a necessity. We grew our food. We ate it in the summer. We canned it and froze it for the winter. And it was just a way of life. So I was drawn to nature and to the land from the way I grew up. Right now, I continue to have a garden. As a matter of fact, the slides I will show you, with the exception of two of them, are all from my vegetable garden. And so what I hope is that during this presentation, you'll be a little bit inspired, you will gain some information, and that all of us will have a wonderful vegetable gardening season. I'm excited about sharing this information with you. Now, what I was going to ask you, I'd like to see a show of hands of those of you who have lived in Western North Carolina for less than 10 years. Oh, wait a minute. I, I see hands there. I see one, two, three, four, two, 470. I see a lot of hands going up from people who are relatively new to the area. But what about have those of you who've lived here less than five years? Okay, I still see quite a few hands at less than two years. Several of us are less than two years. Now, wait a minute. Raise your hand if you're a native. One, two, three. Not many of us, although there are a few natives around. Many of us have come here recently. Many of us are beginning to garden because of our schedule change with work or retirement or just our own personal family situation. Some of us have turned to this because it was a passion from our childhood. We begin vegetable gardening for many reasons, but one of the most important aspects of that is planning your vegetable garden. Why should we plant? When I first started gardening, I don't really think I planned. I thought, I want to grow some tomatoes and some onions, and I just put them in the ground. It not work, but if you plan in the long term, you will have better production. You're going to have more vegetables. You'll have larger vegetables, healthier vegetables. You will have more long-term enjoyment. And one of the best parts for me is it's fun. And here you see a picture of some green beans that I've picked, and those tomatoes are from my garden. Oh, I forgot to tell you, that in between each informational slide, there will be an additional slide of just something that's been going on in my garden. This was from a few years ago. In the foreground, you can see squash growing. On the left is one of my two scarecrows. See the other one far off in the distance there. And by the way, scarecrows really do scarecrows. Uh, we put them out early in the spring and during the Winter and very early spring, there are crows that come into our backyard and around the garden, put up those hair crows, and they're not around anymore. Just something to think about. On the right hand side of this slide, you can see tomatoes that have cages and posts that are holding them up because tomatoes are vines. You'll see some marigolds planted in there. And on the upper right, there's what we call a bean house, it's a structure where beans grow up the sides and across the top. And you'll also see uh, strings for pole beans on the left. Anyway, picture up in my garden. 
As you begin to plan, one of the most important things that you will do is select a site. You got to decide where this garden is going to go. There are a few very important considerations when you select this site, but one of them is sunlight. You got to have sun to grow good vegetables. It's recommended at least six hours a day, but eight to 10 is much better. When I started out, 10 hours of sun a day. And notice that next suggestion there that says away from buildings and trees. My garden is near the border of our backyard. Our neighbors have trees. Those have grown and I don't have quite as much sun as I used to. So that's a consideration now. You do take into consideration that your garden needs sun. So away from buildings and trees. Drainage on your garden is a consideration too. Higher ground will tend to escape freezes, as the slide is telling you. And you don't want a real boggy, moist area. So there needs to be some drainage. This is a photo of borage, which is an herb. The flowers are edible, but I'll plant it for two reasons. One is because I have flowers in my garden as pollinators to attract butterflies, bees, other insects that will help pollinate, but also because I like blue, so borage. As you select a site, think about water. We've mentioned sun, but you got to have water. It does rain. It rains intermittently in western North Carolina, but it can get really dry for periods of time. A water hose is excellent. You can use a sprinkler, depending on if you have that available and the size of your garden. A plain old watering can or a bucket is good, too. This is a picture on the right of my rusty faucet <laughs> that's out near my garden. But I do sometimes use a bucket. You can see that. But I do sometimes use a watering can if I'm planting or if I'm encouraging plants along. This photo shows tomatoes, as you will see, just from my garden. And if you look closely, you'll see the marigolds. And I think there's some lantana in there. You can see Rudbeckia or Black-Eyed Susans off in the distance. In addition to considering your site, it's important to choose your vegetables. I think when I started growing vegetables, I only grew a couple of things. And let me also say that it's important to start small, especially if you are just preparing your site or just beginning. But as far as your vegetables, choose what you love. Choose what your family eats. But that's a big consideration. As far as sunlight is concerned, like we said, you need at least six hours a day. Some vegetables are shade tolerant more than others. For example, some of the brassicas, cabbage, broccoli, those sort of things. In early spring, with cool weather crops like lettuces and spinach, you can plant those before leaves come on trees. And you'll have an appropriate spot for them also. Think about the size limitations. For example, cabbage, you see the, the photo right there, must be planted far enough apart for them to expand and grow. So that's important to think about. Another thing to think about is crop rotation. Uh, that term means changing the location that you plant the crops from year to year. It's not healthy if you plant beans in the same spot to year after year, or cabbages or tomatoes or, or whatever you're growing. If you do that, there's much more of a likelihood that there will be insect infestation, and there could possibly be a disease you know, that you experience. Some Vegetable gardeners rotate their crops every year. I'm a little more flexible or laid back, and I tend to use a three-year rotation, but I don't want to let the same crops grow in the same spaces year after year. And here are some carrots. Those came from my garden. In order to grow carrots, it is really important to prepare the soil, remove the rocks, anything that might prevent the carrots from growing straight down in the ground. One of the fun things to do is draw a diagram and, and another couple of slides here. There will actually be an illustration of a drawing on a piece of paper, but 
before you actually draw it, it's important to walk out there to that space in your yard, measure it off, and stake the corners. It'll give you kind of a feel of the, the space you have. It will help you with your drawing of getting the proportions relatively close. Let me mention also that gardens are not always square. Mine started out about a third of the size of what you see on the left. It might have been kind of a square to start with. It extended on back to become an, a rectangle. It became sort of an L shape. And there is a section that's triangular. I think you're going to see a, a closer picture of that in just a moment. But gardens are not always square. On the right of this slide, there's a picture of my husband, Terry, and what he's doing is marking off a space on the grass for when we extended our raised beds down the hill. And I don't think I've talked about raised beds. And that is something that I'll expand upon a bit more in the following slides. But we do have raised beds, so you can see the sort of frames of those there. This is the little triangular area of the garden. And it is, as you can see, back a bit more toward the woods or toward the neighbor's trees. And uh, what I did for a while was any perennial I had left over, I just kind of stuck it in there. And so now it's this beautiful perennial bed, and it's just frequently covered with butterflies. As you progress toward drawing a diagram, think about whether you'd like to have rows or raised beds or just beds. Your garden, it might, it might not be a geometric outline. But think about whether you're going to have rows or, or raised beds or how you'd like to approach that. Uh, by the way, the slide on the right, there is a raised bed, but it has rows inside it. <laughs> and this is actually a fall garden. It's an autumn garden. Which, and those are probably like beets or turnips that have been planted close. They have not yet been thinned out. So those tiny little rows be growing there will be thinned out as they get a little bit bigger. He doesn't love sunflowers. Um, I always try to have some sunflowers in my gardens. They're so beautiful, midsummer, late summer, and they're wonderful for attracting pollinators. Aha, uh -huh, here we go, drawing a diagram. I frequently use notebook paper. In this case, you see a diagram on grass paper. I used to just do diagrams on loose paper. Now I try to keep them in a gardening journal. But anyway, consider different possibilities. Graph paper lets you get the proportions relatively accurate. Pencil makes it possible for you to write something down and then move it around. But anyway, drawing a diagram is a dream on paper. Oh, here is my garden in the winter. Again, this was a couple of years ago, but you can see it from a different angle. There are raised beds. There's a fence in the front. In the back, you're seeing compost bins, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, too. And that's a garden shed. Just uh, try to not pay too much attention to those weeds. Uh, okay, drawing a diagram. As you plan your garden, don't forget perennials. And you might not be a person who's especially attracted to flowers, but flowers attract pollinators. In order for a blossom, on a squash plant or on a bean plant or a tomato plant or, or any of those vegetables that we might grow, it's essential that flower be pollinated by honeybees or, or other insects that go from flower to flower and carry that nectar and pollen and pollinate those flowers. I hope your vegetables grow. Here we have a wonderful little honeybee. Think about soil quality. As I mentioned that, I uh, see your faces. Well, maybe I don't, but frequently people project, like, well, you should see my soil quality. Red clay mud. My house is just built and you won't believe how hard this soil is. Uh, how do you get that red clay to change into fertile, loose, wonderful garden soil? Well, what you do is you add organic matter. And that doesn't happen overnight. Um, I would encourage you, whether you're just tilling up or digging up some ground or you know, whether you're doing a raised bed, don't try to completely remove all of the soil. If there's grass or sod on the top, yes, you might want to remove that in order to help your growing area. But if you can add 
shredded leaves, compost, manure. And you can buy bags of manure, add that to change the consistency of the soil to make it more pliable, to let the roots of plants grow more easily into that. So good time to enrich your soil is in early spring, also in the fall. The photos you're looking here are of green manure or cover crops. These are the two sides that are not from my garden. I am not really experienced with cover crops. I have friends who do this all the time and they grow these crops They'll plant them in the fall, they grow during the winter, they flower in the spring, and then they just cut this down, turn the soil under, and it enriches the soil. So it's a really good idea and something I plan to explore. I'm a pretty experienced gardener. I'm always learning something. I always want to try something new. So that's one of the exciting things about this whole process. Here's a compost bin. And let me mention that for many years, my compost was a compost pile. I just took the weeds, and that is without seeds. You don't want to put weed seeds into a compost pile. I just pulled up the roots, and you have the green part of the plants, the sticks, the leaves. Throw them in a pile at the corner of your garden. What happens is it eventually breaks down. It rots down. And you can find you've got some pretty good garden soil there toward the bottom of the pile. <laughs> what I learned as I went along is that that happens much more efficiently if that is layered. We layer green garden waste with ground, with water. Oh, and throw in some soil. And by the way, when I was talking about the quality of your soil a few moments ago, I don't think I actually said this, but... The red clay native soil has many nutrients. It can enrich anything else you add to it and be enriched by the compost you add to it. So we don't want to discard that. I throw native red clay soil into these compost piles to layer them as I go along. The reason three different sections here is because I have a pile of greens that are just new this year. I have a pile that's rotting down from last year, and then I have some that's been there for two years. And by then, it's pretty much some really nice garden soil. Like I said, it's not necessary to have compost bins in order to have good compost in process. But that's what this is. Fertilizing. Do you need fertilizer? I don't know. The way to find out is a couple of ways. Soil tests are available at the Extension Master Gardener office. It's a good idea to do multiple soil tests every few years, like maybe every three years. And one might think, why multiple? If your garden is any medium size, you can test in one area and the quality of the soil might be different than it would be in another area. So do multiple tests. Six to six five pH is good for garden soil. And sometimes it's advisable to add lime or to add fertilizer before planting or after planting. If you are fertilizing just generally and haven't had the time to process a soil test yet this spring, probably like an eight 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 or a ten 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 fertilizer is good. And there are different ways to apply it. Um, you can broadcast that is. Spread it with a gloved hand over the area that you'll be growing. You can band it, which means to add the fertilizer along the side of plants where you're going to plant them or probably that are already in the ground. You can also side dress. That is, if you have tomatoes that are spaced some little distance apart, instead of doing an entire band of fertilizer, you can just add it beside those individual plants. The reason you would add it beside instead of directly is because the fertilizer can burn or be too strong or actually injure the roots. Just read the information on the fertilizer. And here's just your classic 10, 10, 10 plant food, lawn and garden fertilizer. That's pretty good stuff. Garden tools. Okay. You see here on the left, shovel, a hoe, a 
a broom, a rake, those are the common garden tools that one might use. A trowel is probably what I use almost more than anything else. I do use a small mantis tiller. I want you to notice the quality of that broom. This broom used to be in my house. And maybe it went from the house to the garage and it became so worn down that it wasn't really useful anymore. Then it graduated and it graduated to the garden. And I used that broom in the garden to sweep off the tops of raised beds. Just occasionally tasks come up that I need a broom for. So that's my garden broom. You'll see on the right hand side of this slide, my husband actually took this without my knowing about it, but there I am in my overalls out there in all my glory with my mantis tiller. And notice I'm standing beside the raised bed, not in it. Yeah. This is a picture from inside my greenhouse. And you might be saying, oh my goodness, she got a greenhouse. I didn't always have a greenhouse. It is absolutely wonderful. It's an addition onto the back of our garage. I do use it to start seedlings. I've got some stuff going early and it's just something I really enjoy. Additionally, with garden tools, you will, from time to time, need to move dirt, move weeds, move sticks, and whatever else. I use a wheelbarrow a lot. I do not have a spreader that could be used if you have a larger garden for fertilizer. But, yeah, that would be very helpful to have a wheelbarrow. And here is a wheelbarrow full of mulch. These are leaves that have been mowed over and mulched up in the fall. With that collection of garden tools, Incidentally, it's good to have a measuring tape, not only when you're drawing your plans and getting things set up, but just from time to time, you need a measuring tape. Kneeling pads, a good idea. Definitely hat and gloves. Forgot to mention sunscreen. So yeah, you're out there in the elements. I usually work, and sometimes people ask me this, a lot of times I'm out in my garden from about 8 until 10 on summer mornings. Sometimes after four until kind of supper time close in the evenings. But occasionally I'm out in the middle of the day and that hat comes in handy. Here are some perennials. These are black-eyed Susans, Rudbeckia growing in the garden. And on the left-hand side, you see a piece of PVC pipe. That is like a hoop where I have put a cover over something. We'll see a bit more of that too. Garden structures. I love garden structures. My garden is horizontal. It is also very vertical. Now, we didn't gain these things overnight. I've been gardening where I live right now for more than 20 years, so I added to this as I went along. On the left-hand side, green stakes, and what we have done, not everybody does this, is we put a tomato cage around the stake. That way, the cage is solidified. You know, the tomatoes are planted inside at the base, and they're, they have a really reliable structure. On the right-hand side, several things are going on there. You can still see those tomato cages. If you look on the extreme right, there are tall posts where I string beans onto them. I do sometimes grow bush beans, but most of what I grow are whole beans, and so you'll see that. We did not have a fence to start with. So there was no fence. You see the wooden fence on the right. But if you look closely, and I'll talk about the blue window frames. When you look closely where the blue window frames are, there is actually a low fence. I don't think it shows up that well in the slide, but you see the gate in the bottom right-hand side. There were a couple years in a row that we just had bunches of rabbits. And as soon as I would plant the beans, barely start growing they get eaten to the ground. And so after that happened a few times, we decided, okay, we're going to have to go ahead and invest in some rabbit wire. And so we fenced an area of our garden. It has two little gates, you can see, that's on the lower right. That enclosed a small rectangular area of the garden. On both sides, I had pole beans going up in my garden. In the middle of the summer, with a gate, like a little entrance on each end, and pole beans blowing up on both sides, I thought, this is like a garden room. It's just, you go out here in your, in your own little wonderful room. So I thought, why not have windows? Anyway, so on one end, 
we have a metal pipe you can see that runs out and down and we just have hangers that hang blue window frames on there it's for fun but we also use that as a trellis from year to year i have either put sunflowers in front of it and it kind of helps stake them up i've had beans grow up it i've had morning glories grow up it at one point i think but anyway it just encloses a garden room and you may be getting this from how I'm communicating to you that my garden is fun. Now, listen, I'm not kidding. It's, it's work. You go out there, you, it's definitely work. I have as many weeds and bugs as anybody else, but I just make it a fun place. You can see the blue window frames on the far right. And I'll show you a closer shot is the bean house. You can see that, but steaks, cages for tomatoes and beans. These are some cabbages that are under a PVC pipe. There's a close mesh screen over that. And this was improvised. It was experimental. So I just rolled the screen around the boards you can see laying on top of the raised bed. The idea was to keep those little pipe butterflies off the cabbages. They would lay their eggs and hatch out and have those worms eating up the cabbage. So this really was pretty efficient. More garden structures. Why not use what's already there? You might have a wooden fence. You might have a wire fence. I do have things occasionally grow up the fence that you can see the wooden fence and the moon gate. And it's just called that because the round circle is just something we added a few years ago. Notice, okay, on the right hand side, those beans that are growing up are on the bean house. And on the left hand side, the beans are on strings that are strung across a pole there. And the scarecrows are standing guard. As a matter of fact, the scarecrow standing guard there can use him occasionally or her, there are two of them, as a, a structure for growing. This is a moonflower and just one right up the scarecrow there. Additionally, garden structures, uh, besides beans, cucumbers, peas, you have lower growing vegetables on the lower right you see an old window frame. I am a great fan of yard sales, also of flea markets, vintage shops, and I just come across odd and interesting things that we use in the garden. So there's a cucumber trellis. In the upper right, you see some of the same structures we've talked about previously. And on the left, if you look closely, you can see beans growing in that bean house. Here are beans. Any beans growing up those. This is the side of the bean house. Every year, I, I look at it day after day, and the bean vines rush to see who can get to the top first. It's always interesting to see who is a winner. Look at these garden structures. Okay. <laughs> We're getting a little creative here. We talked about the ones on the left. On the right hand side, I have a blue chest of drawers i just again i like blue so, and it has plants inside that's one of those fun things and this structure has no purpose whatsoever except to look cool there we go <laughs> think about seeds and plant sources some of the plants you'll have in your garden you will grow from seeds probably others you may grow the seedling that's already established you're familiar with many of these from catalogs, department stores, garden shops that specialize. Sometimes friends give you some seeds or your neighbors, that sort of thing. So you can actually start those early inside your house in March, April. Many will be recommended by the package to be sown directly into the soil. And we're going to wait a little while later in the spring for that. With transplants, when you find those at a garden store, don't necessarily go for the taller plant or the tallest plant. I would encourage you to get a medium height and, a, and you're saying, oh, yeah, green, but a medium green or an intense green um, color. Double check them for insects. I know a couple of times that I have brought plants home with insects on them and so you got to check to see that there are no insects and a good root system and again one might say how do you know if they have a good root system i'm not saying do this all the time but i have been known to 
Let me check that. What is just I'll check that and put it back. Okay. Uh, anyway, be sure they have a good root system. It's a good idea to plant not in the bright heat of the day. Plant in the evening on a cloudy day, if at all possible, because what that does is ease those little baby plants out into the real world. You may have heard of hardening them off. If you have a tray of, of several tomatoes or other plants and that are kind of tender plants that you're going to put outside, instead of just buying them at a store and putting them in your garden, I would encourage you to consider buying them, water them, nurse them along for several days, and set your tray of plants out in the sunlight a couple of hours and then maybe half a day so they're getting used to it and then place them in the garden. And I think they will really appreciate it. Another thing you will hear this if you haven't experienced it, it might seem not the natural thing to do, but tomatoes and peppers are probably healthier if you plant them deep. Blast in far up on the stem, put the stem in the ground as well as the roots. And that was just as strange as it might seem. When I was a new gardener, that was really hard for me to do because if I bought an eight or 10 inch tomato, I wanted to put it in a garden and let it be tall. But I have learned that if I go ahead and place part of that stem, significant stem underground, it's going to send out little roots. It's going to strengthen that plant and it'll grow a lot faster and healthier than it would if I didn't do that. And this is a little pot that you'll grow from seeds. And this is actually common milkweed that I'm getting ready to transplant into my garden, which it will become a pollinator. It also can become invasive, so put it in a place, well, maybe not invasive it spreads, but in a place that it will have room to spread out. And common milkweed is not only a pollinator, it is a food source for monarch. Okay, seeds and plant sources. Again, this sounds like, uh, okay, I already knew that, but read the packet. If you think you know how to plant the seed, I would say still read the packet. It will advise you about the conditions you need and about the depth, which is usually three to four times the diameter of the seed. So if you're planting a bean, you might be planting it half an inch deep. But if you're planting carrots, tiny little seeds, you're just barely going to cover them with an eighth of an inch or a fourth of an inch. It's something to think about. Here we have monarch caterpillars. Look at it. There are three of them there. I had a variety of milkweed at my house before I ever intentionally planted it or before I knew that much about it. And this was several years ago. I went out and I thought, oh, God, there's a, a caterpillar on that. And I said, there are three of them. There are 16 of them. Really? And I, I read up about monarchs and I learned everything I possibly can. And I began bringing them in to raise them and protect them. I actually do that from the egg stage instead of from the caterpillar stage. And I know there are different veins of thinking about that, but so much of what I've learned lets me know that such a small percentage actually survive when they're out in the garden that I am doing that. And it's a lot of fun. I think I've got a couple of slides coming up with those. Think about spacing your plants. Whether you use beds or rows or hills or square foot method, which would mean actually considering square feet of space within your garden. Mel Bartholomew published information about this a number of years ago. Think about how plants will be spaced. What you're looking at right here are hills of squash. Notice that there are several plants on each hill. I will, or I did at the time this was taken, thin those. I said they're spaced out a little bit more. But this garden bed is four feet by 11 feet. So in four feet, notice that I have a rectangular, as you're an oval hill. And so I can have more than one plant in that space, but I will thin those out a little bit. You got to allow enough room for the leaves, the stalk, the vegetables. But there's some monarchs on my head. When they hatch out, they are very delicate. They don't fly for about an hour or an hour and a half after their hatch. So I'm just taking them outside to, to release and chew the big wild world. Whether you're watching this video 
in the early spring or the late spring or in the fall. Oh, my goodness. The weather in Western North Carolina is so unpredictable, as it is in, in many places, but especially in these mountains. It seems like spring, but then it's not. It gets really warm, but then it's cold. We are in zone seven, which means that in the early spring, frost comes and goes. If you have placed delicate plants outside, like tomatoes, and you know that there's going to be a frost, know that it will kill those plants. You can cover them with jugs, with pots, with boxes. I put a box out there with a rock on the top. I take a plastic pots sometimes and turn them down over, but only overnight. If you leave your covering on during the next day, the sun shines on it, it's going to get too hot and the heat will damage your plant. Sometimes we go through a symphony, we go through a dance of planting and covering and uncovering and wishing we hadn't planted that plant yet in the spring here. Avoid midday planting and be aware that wind can damage, like if there's a significant wind, it can damage delicate plants. And let me go ahead and say at this point, I personally really encourage you not to put springtime or late spring plants in your garden until after Mother's Day. And I know we don't want to hear that. The fact is, our final frost might be late April. It might not frost again in, in mid-May, but it may frost literally the first week or a week into May. So just that's what I would encourage you to do. These are bean flowers. Has some bean vines grow up the strings. Keep records. I do this. I am not excellent at this. But in a notebook, it's a really great idea to keep your plans, your receipts, your records of when you planted things, the names of the things that you planted, what works, what doesn't work well. I really encourage garden journaling. Uh, apples. I have a couple of small dwarf apple trees in my garden. So again, just the fruits of the season. And I forgot to tell you, when you see the references, that would tend to indicate the end of the presentation. And it does not, because after we acknowledge that background information came from the North Carolina Master Gardener Training Manual and also from Mel Bartholomew's Square Foot Gardening, after I acknowledge that, I want to continue not with information slides, but with just sharing slides. And there are several of these. This was my garden, I'm pretty sure, the first year I had it. Before we bought our house, someone had a garden spot there, but it wasn't really established very well. And if you look closely, you can see that I, I did raised beds. Look at them. But my raised beds don't have any sides. We created pathways, dug those out, put some mulch down, mounded the soil a little bit. And I think what you see there are cabbages that are planted, but that's how we started out. Here I am, and this is that early garden. I guess that was the next year or two because we had built those first raised beds. In the front are perennials. We've got the tomato steaks, and things are coming right along. A few years later, and you can see the raised beds in the upper part of the slide. This is where we extended the garden down on the hill, and you might be fortunate enough to have your garden on an almost flat area. Mine's got a hill, as you can see. The raised beds are built up a little bit on the upper end and significantly on the lower end, <laughs> but that was out of necessity in my garden. And notice that right now there's sod in there. You can see the grass. We would have Pull a little bit more of that out before we started breaking that soil up a lot better and adding to it and amending it and filling it up. Here's a garden from a different view. This is an early spring shot. Oh, and I forgot to tell you also, I have pots in my garden. This one shows in the center a blue pot. I've got a grouping of pots in the upper garden and grouping of pots in the lower garden. And honestly, they're just for fun strawberries. Who doesn't want 
um, um, strawberries. Yeah. Well, strawberries. Beans. You see these growing on the bean house. And these honestly look almost too large. You turn your back on the beans and there they are. Once they start growing, I try to pick beans every other day. But I, I do canned beans and they're just wonderful. There's a card. It's on a, the coleus, you can see there, on a blue pot. Tomatoes, a variety of tomatoes, different kinds of tomatoes. We are blessed with having quite a variety of tomatoes. If you're buying seedlings, you can find those at garden shops. You can find them on, at organic grower school. You can find them at the herb. There's more than one herb festival around here. And I know that tomatoes can have diseases. They can have pest control problems. But I just always work around that. And what's better than a home grown tomato? Um, oh, here's where you're seeing my, the structures that we added, the window frames. And in this case, with some things. Oh, and you can also see that little low fence in this shop. Oh, I these are peas. Peas are either an early spring or an autumn crop because they really do better with cool weather. I didn't show this or I didn't point it out earlier with the garden structures. But if you'll look, these are growing on a baker's rack. Just a one, one end of one of my beds, I have a baker's rack. Birdhouse. There are a couple of birdhouses out there and the beans are growing up. Oh, yeah. And I'm going every year. And Frequently, it's bluebirds, not always, but frequently bluebirds make their homes and raise their families. And I just, what I do is open the bird hands and take a photo down. And yeah, don't bother the birds, but yeah. Blueberries, I grow it toward the back of the garden. And these are just so yummy and luscious and fun. Oh, and listen, I've, I've talked about the goal is to raise vegetables, but the goal for me is also to have a place that invites me out there and is fun. So this was a yard sale thing. There was an iron, uh, just like a wrought iron doll bed. And so I thought, I can do something with that. So within a raised bed of my garden, I have this little wrought iron doll bed. And so we have a bed of lettuce. That's all I have to say about that. Okay. There are animals in the gardens and frequently people ask what do you do about the deer what do you do about the groundhogs and you do the best you can and that's probably a whole different presentation but we do invite some wildlife into the garden there are frogs and turtles and just little varmints that eat the bugs and are so much fun to watch so here's a turtle in the garden this is a bed of carrots, and it's as thick and lush as these look that have been thinned. If they hadn't been thinned, then I would just have teensy little pencil-like carrots. You have to thin the plants in order for the carrots to grow. And are you surprised? There's a blue chair. Okay, here are the carrots in a bowl, and I think you already saw a picture of the carrots on the counter. You can see, if you look closely, this garden frame that we looked at earlier, there are cucumbers growing up on that, as well as there you can see zinnias, and those are the blueberry bushes in the back. I did have a net over those, and it's been moved later in the season. Another picture just from my garden. It's fun showing these to you, but it's fun for me to see them again, too. <laughs> these are turnips. This is a fall crop. I always have a winter garden or a fall garden, but I do sometimes. It's, it's just... A different growing experience. You can extend your gardening season from early spring through the summer into the fall and winter, and it's just delightful. Here's another picture. You have to look closely this time. Blue pots. Now, you might like red pots or green pots, or maybe you don't want pots like containers in your garden, but you have to look closely through the flowers to see the blue pots there. So that's a middle of the summer top shot. Here is some cabbage from the fall. This is an autumn garden. This is some Chinese cabbage growing. And there's that scarecrow again. Right now, he is gardening the squash, the tomatoes. 
bee balm in the foreground and the squash is still blooming and you can see the beans in the background. And I would like to say thank you. I want to thank you for tuning in, for listening to this, to hopefully getting some inspiration in your own garden as you plan your vegetable garden. If you have questions or need some help, we do have a Master Gardener Helpline. That's a service that's provided through the Extension Office. There are folks who will be here at the office. That number is posted on your screen. That It's pretty easy to remember the 255-5522. Make a note. Okay, and it is open throughout the summer and into the fall. There are folks who are waiting here who are ready to help you. So I hope you'll take advantage of this. As we finish things up, instead of stopping immediately, I want to think reflectively since this is being recorded and since you don't have the opportunity to actually ask questions, I want to mention a couple that I've been asked frequently and that might be helpful to you. Well, I've already mentioned people ask, do you actually have to wait until after Mother's Day? And I would say, that's what I would advise, yes. What are the best kind of pole beans to grow? There are a lot of really, there are, there are at least several really good kinds out there. I just do blue pole beans. They grow really well here. How do you keep your tomatoes from getting diseases? You can't, but there are things you can do preventatively. You rotate that crop, move it to another location within your garden the second or third year. You clean up the refuse from underneath the tomatoes, which tends to prevent diseases and as much bug infestation. And um, you can really grow some good tomatoes. How do you deal with the bugs? They're out there, aren't they? I use what's called IPM, which is Integrated Pest Management. So I discourage you from going out there and spraying using pesticide sprays. I realize that people do that sometimes. First of all, try to observe your plants. Be aware of what's going on. You may see eggs on the underside of a leaf. Pick that leaf off or break part of that leaf off. Get rid of those eggs before they hatch out. We call this mechanical removal. But basically, you pick the bugs out and... Uh, if you're squeamish about that, wear garden gloves. You can have a cup of soapy water, drop them in, or whatever it takes to get rid of those. I also sometimes plant trap crops, as in a, a crop that's planted alongside if one vegetable that I really wish to encourage that also attracts those insects, and they tend to go to one plant and not another. I sometimes intersperse plants, like I plant the basil in with the tomatoes, or I plant the onions in with the cabbages, that sort of thing, because instead of having a large group of one kind of plant where the bugs will just come try to eat it up, it, when you intersperse them, it kind of discourages them along the way. People ask me, do marigolds really help keep bugs away? Scientifically, I think the answer to that is no. According to Mary Alice's experience, I just like doing it anyway because it might help and they're pretty. Let's see. Uh, what else is a frequently asked question? People do ask me, how much time do you spend in the garden? And this is what I do. I spend the time in the garden that it takes to keep that garden healthy and pretty. I don't spend enough time to be discouraged. I want to enjoy it. I want to love it. I want that garden to call me out there and see progress that's being made. Because I told you at the beginning of this presentation, I love vegetable gardening. Thank you so much.